Okay. I was just checking the quizzes before I came down here, and it looks like most of the quizzes have been picked up, but there are a few still left over. They'll stay out till probably about 5 o'clock today because tomorrow I've got to put out my corporate finance quizzes so to prevent them from getting mixed up. So by, tonight, by, by this evening, they'll come back into my office. If you want to pick them up, pick them up right after class today if you haven't picked it up already. The other is I want to remind you that the Mystery Project is online. I sent you that link. If you had a chance, read it. If you haven't had a chance yet, read it soon because it's due two weeks from today. Two weeks from today at 5 p.m. on that day. Two, so it's a Wednesday at 5 p.m. So if you look at the mystery project, it's really an exercise in pricing. It's everything we're talking about right now. How do you find cheap stocks, not from an intrinsic value standpoint, but from a pricing standpoint? Okay? So today we're going to continue our discussion of finding cheap stocks. So let me set the table. Last session we talked about how to find a cheap company based on P-E ratios, right? We look for a low P-E ratio, then we look for a mismatch. Mismatch in what sense? You want to take away any explanation for the low P-E. So you're looking for high growth and low risk and high return on equity. So today we're going to build on that. We're going to talk about peg ratios and price to book ratios and revenue multiples. And with each one, it'll look like I'm reinventing the wheel and presenting with a different equation. But in fact, it's the same process over and over again. So, even though we haven't done this yet, I think you already have the ammunition to kind of deal with these different multiples. So let me throw a few multiples at you. One of the more widely used multiples, an intuitive multiple, is the price to book ratio. Market value of equity divided by book value of equity. Market capitalization divided by what you see on the balance sheet. So let's suppose you're looking at three companies. Okay? They all have the same cost of equity. One has a return equity of 12%, one has a return equity of 10%, the third is a return equity of 8%. Same cost of equity, different returns in equity. Even before you look at the price to book ratios for these three companies, which of these three companies is most likely to be trading at below book value and why? Three companies, same cost of equity, different returns in equity. Which of the three companies is most likely to be trading at below book value and why? Which company? And what is it about company C that's going to make it? Its return in equity is, very, is much less than its cost of equity. That's, in fact, what we're going to do. Today, we're going to link up price to book ratios to that spread that you earn over the cost of equity. I'm going to show that if your company earns exactly its cost of equity, return equity is equal to cost of equity, the price to book ratio should be close to one. You're trading at book value. If you earn less than your cost of equity, you're going to trade at a discount on book value. And the reason I bring that up is you'll be surprised how much equity research is built on a very simple sales pitch. This stock is cheap because it trades at less than book value. Sounds alluring, right? So what's the first question you need to ask me when I tell you the stock is cheap because it trades at less than book value? What's its return on equity? 90% of the time, that sales pitch is going to go out of the window because I'm going to say it earns 3%, minus 5%, 7%. So with price to book ratios, the variable we're going to focus on is return on equity. We're also going to talk about revenue multiples, multiples of revenues, price to sales, EV to sales. Why do we use revenue multiples? Because it's a one number that's almost always guaranteed to be positive, right? With the price earnings ratios, we talked about how you can get negative earnings. So let's assume that you're looking at revenue multiples of retail companies. That's where it's most widely used. And you're looking across a bunch of retail companies, looking at which companies trade at low multiples of revenues. Which of these groups of companies is most likely to look cheap to you? It's not cheap, but it's going to look cheap in terms of trading at low multiples of revenues. Department stores, discount retailers, luxury retailers, or none of the above. And why? The question I'm asking is what drives EV to say, the revenue multiple? Why are some companies trading at low multiples of revenues and other high multiples of revenues? And the clue is somewhere in the choices I've given. Which of these companies is going to look cheapest to you if you just list them all out and based on low to high in terms of revenue multiples? What's the difference between those three groups of retailers? Margins. Discount retailers have low margins. So even very successful discount retailers like Walmart have low margins. Even very unsuccessful luxury retailers have high margins. Why? Because they charge high prices. 
if I did not control for that, the Walmarts of the world are always going to look cheap to me because they trade at low multiples of revenues. The Ann Taylors of the world are always going to look expensive to me because they trade at high multiples of revenues. In fact, I'm going to use that as my wedge today to talk about the value of a brand name. I've kind of mentioned this before, but the value of a brand name comes from the fact that you can charge a higher price for exactly the same product, right? And the way this manifests itself is in terms of the margins you see generated by a company. So I'm going to pick a sector where if you look at the breakdown of companies, you get one breakdown if you look at revenues, you get an entirely different breakdown in terms of profits. It's a smartphone business. If you look at a pie chart of who gets revenues from smartphones, Apple actually is not the largest smartphone manufacturer in the world. Samsung actually gets more revenues from smartphones than Apple does. So if you look at a pie chart of revenues, the market share for Samsung is higher than the market share for Apple. Do you know that 90% of all the operating profits made in the smartphone business are made by just Apple? It accounts for only like 25% of the revenues or less, but it accounts for 90% of the operating profit. And the reason is very simple. When you look at the operating margin for Apple, I mean, you just compare the numbers in the last column. Let's take, this is, I know, an old table. You can update it. But if you look at the, the, the operating margin for Apple, in 2011, it's 35%. Look at the operating margin for every other smartphone company. That is the value of a brand name. When you see that big a difference between the operating margin of a company and everybody else, we're talking about brand name value. And today, we'll find a way to actually put a number on the value of a brand name. So we're going to talk about price earnings ratios, peg ratios. So we're going to go across the spectrum. And with each one, I'm going to stop and ask, what are the variables I should be controlling for? And you're going to see, as I said, the same game played out over and over again. So let me go back to what I was doing towards the end of the last class. I was playing the role of a naive analyst, an analyst who just looked at PE ratios and asked you to do something. And I said, push back. Tell me what I'm missing. So today, I'm going to start with something that you see in the papers all the time. And right now, the big talk is stocks overvalued. Stocks have been going up for so long, they must be overvalued. And in fact, there are some very well-known voices, people with Nobel Prizes pushing the argument that stocks are overpriced. Robert Schiller, won the Nobel Prize five years ago, has argued for the last few years that stocks are in a bubble. If you boil it down to basics, one of the arguments that many of these people use is the price earnings ratio for, for stocks. Well, that happened. I think we're on page 30. There you go. That the price earnings ratio for stocks today is higher than it's been historically. And that's true. In fact, if you look at the price earnings ratios at the end of two, in January 2017, the price earnings ratio for the S&P 500 was almost 21. And you can compare it to any prior time period. But in 1969 through 2016, for instance, it was about 16. You look at every particular time period, price earnings ratios today are higher than they've been before. What Schiller brings to the table is he's adjusted the PE for what he thinks are its missing variables. One thing he does, for instance, of using last year's earnings, he looks at an average earnings over the last 10 years, saying I shouldn't be just focusing on last year's earnings. Earnings can go up and down. He also adjusts for inflation. Do you see why he has to? Because if I take inflation in 2000, earnings in 2007 and earnings in 2016, because of inflation, the two numbers can't be added up. So he inflation adjusts numbers and he normalizes them. He comes up with what's called a Schiller PE, which is what's in the last column. A Schiller PE is a normalized inflation adjusted PE, but every single measure of PE, if you just stop there, it looks like stocks are priced at much higher levels than they were historically. That's a fact. It's, you know, there's no point arguing that. So ready? I'm going to put out my recommendation on stocks, and you tell me what I might be missing. So here's the argument I make. I tell you that stocks are overpriced because the P-E ratio today is higher than it's been historically. The part of that statement is true. The P-E ratio today is higher than it's been historically. So you, it's your turn to ask me questions. What might I be missing when I jump to that conclusion? Why should stocks P-E ratios be higher today? 
Okay, so let's start with growth. Is it possible that growth today is higher than it was historically? You could push, maybe you could talk about tax cuts pushing up earnings growth. There's some talk about it. But it'd be a really tough case to make, right? Because you know, that's very recent. And this has been going on even before the election. So clearly it can't just be a growth story because the growth story is relatively recent and it's kind of a short-term story. So that's a good question, though. Maybe it would, if it had been higher growth, you could explain the P ratio. Bigger markets, but that's a growth a variant of the growth story, right, basically. But the bigger market story, that's globalization that's been going on for the last 20 years, this is the S&P 500. So I don't think the growth story is going to take you very long. So let's move to the what's the, uh, what's the second variable. Maybe there's a risk story. And if you're telling a risk story, what, do you, what, what should your story be? That stocks today are somehow less risky than they were five years ago. And again, you're going to see very quickly that the risk story is not going to get you very far. Looks like we're coming to the same conclusion as Schiller. Stocks might be overvalued, right? But there's one other piece of this story. What, if I don't buy stocks, what do I put my money in? What's my, I'm going to put it in bonds or bills, right? You see what that next part of the story is? What's that story? Rates are much lower now than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. 10 years ago, if you did not put your money in stocks, you put them in T-bonds, you made 4.5%. 20 years ago, if you didn't buy stocks, you put them in bonds, you made 6.5%. 30 years ago, if you didn't buy stocks, you put them in bonds, you made 8%. Today, you don't buy stocks, you put them in bonds, you make 2%. You've got to live in the world you're in, not the world you wished you were in. In this world, your choices have become much less attractive. So guess what? I'm going to push up the prices of stocks to reflect the fact that my alternatives are not as attractive. So the statement I would make about stocks is if you look at stock prices today versus 10 or 20 years ago, they look expensive relative to history. But I don't have a, I don't have a time machine. I can't go back in time. But if I control for the fact that rates are low today, then it becomes much more difficult to jump to the conclusion that stocks are cheaper expensive. Now you can see why storytelling kind of talks you into a corner, right? Because you could say on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand, stocks look expensive. On the other hand, rates are low. So I'm going to cut through the storytelling. And this is something you're going to see me do over and over again. You saw me do this actually in the last class, is whenever I have variables to control for, rather than continue to tell stories, I'm going to open up my statistics book. And that's what I did. In fact, what I did first was I inverted the P-E ratio. When you invert the P-E ratio, it's called the earnings yield, earnings to price. You get a number that is graphed out in that whatever color that is, that ugly orange, red, yellow, whatever it is. That's the earnings to price ratio. It's the inverse of the price earnings ratio. And on the same graph, I've also put the T-bond rate. Take a look at those two lines. Do they look like they move together? Clearly, there seems to be a relationship. When rates are low, the earnings to price ratio is low, which means the P-E ratio will be high. When rates are high, the earnings to price ratio will be high. In fact, I've added a third series in here. And that third series is actually the difference between the 10-year bond rate and the T-bill rate. What am I capturing when I look at that difference between the 10-year bond rate and the short-term T-bill? When that number is a big positive number, what am I telling you about interest rates? That you've got an upward sloping yield curve, longer-term rates. When that number is zero, you've got a flat yield curve. When that number is negative, you've got a downward sloping yield curve. You say, who cares? It seems to matter. So first thing I did was I did a correlation between the earnings to price ratio and T-bond rates and the difference between the T-bond rate and the T-bill rate, and no surprises. As the T-bond rate increases, my earnings to price ratio reflects it. So basically, you see the relation. I'm sorry, as the T-bond rate increases, my earnings to price ratio increases with it. The correlation is 0.66. So as rates go up, earnings to price ratios go up. As rates go down, earnings to price ratios go down. I know it's tough to do, but earnings to price ratio is the inverse of the P-E ratio. So when earnings to price, price ratios go down, price earnings ratios are going up. But I'm going to go further. I want to be able to tell you today whether stocks are too high or low, given where rates are now, right? So what I did was I ran a regression of earnings to price ratios against the T-bond rate and the difference between the T-bond rate and the T-bill rate. Let's read that regression. For every 1% increase in T-bond rates, the earnings to price ratio increases by 0.56%. And for every 1% increase in the slope of the yield curve, earnings to price ratios decrease by minus 0.14%. Let me cut to the intuition here. As rates go up, P-E ratios come down. That's not a surprise. 
But as term structures become more upward sloping, P ratios increase. So upward sloping term structures seem to be good news for stocks. Flat and downward sloping term structures seem to be bad news for stocks. Why is that, do you think? Why would I care about the slope of the yield curve if I'm an investor in stocks? That's interest rates, right? The bond market. Why would I, when I'm investing in stocks, care about whether I have an upward sloping, a flat, or a downward sloping yield curve? There have been eight occasions in the last 50 years where we've had downward sloping yield curves. 1981, 1990. And as you go down the list and you start listing off the time periods, it turns out that almost every single time you've had a downward sloping yield curve, you've had a recession afterwards. Because usually it's the, the central banks panicking about inflation or interest rates and putting the brakes on the money supply. Historically, the yield curve is a predictor of real growth in the economy, which affects stock prices. But the advantage of running this regression is if I came to you, with interest rates today, the T-bond rate today is 2.5%, and, and the T-bill rate is a half percent. You can put it into that regression and give me a predicted earnings to price ratio today, given the level of rates today. I plugged it in this morning, 2.5% T-bond rate, half percent T-bill rate into that regression. I got a predicted earnings to price ratio of about 5%. We have a predicted earnings to price ratio of 5%. What does that translate into a, in, as a price earnings ratio? 1 over 0.05 is 20. Let me go back and show you what we're at, where we're at now. P ratio for stocks right now is 20.57. Forget about all the adjusted versions. The P ratio today is about 20. That's where you'd expect it to be given where rates are today. So if anybody wants to make an argument that stocks are expensive, there's a bubble, they can make it. But they can't just point to the P-E ratio and say, hey, that's all I need to show. P-E ratio is high. That by itself tells me nothing about whether stocks are cheap or expensive today. So again, we're bringing the same kind of tools to looking at entire markets as we brought to individual stocks. When somebody says something is cheap, we go down the list. What's the growth? What's the risk? What's the return on equity? I could even ask that question about collectively about all stocks. Maybe U.S. stocks are earning a higher return equity than they used to. The only way to check it is to actually look at the numbers. One thing about this relationship between um, stock P-E ratios and interest rates is it's starting to break down. The last 10 years, the rates have stayed so low that that relationship, which used to be much stronger, is now starting to break down. Because 10 years ago, the yield curve was a good predictor of real growth. Now it's no longer doing that because central banks have kept their, you know, kept this expansionary monetary policy going for so long that it might have lost its power. So let's talk about peg ratios. So you have a PE ratio, and we know low, low growth stocks have low PE ratios, high growth stocks have high PE ratios. So if, we, if you just pick stocks based on low PE ratios and say, I will buy only stocks that trade at less than 15 times or less than 10 times earnings. That's fine, but you can almost guarantee, <clears throat> guarantee that the stocks you end up with will be low growth stocks. Much as you'd like to find mismatches, it is difficult to find a stock that's going to grow at 25% a year that's trading at less than 10 times earnings. So let's say you're the tech analyst at Morgan Stanley. You, got, you follow a lot of stocks that trade at really high P-E ratios. And I keep asking you, find me a cheap stock, find me a cheap stock. Using P-E ratios, you can't find a single stock that trades at less, less than 20 times earnings, or whatever the median was for the market. So about 20 years ago, and actually a little longer maybe, analysts following high growth companies decided that they were going to ad adapt the P-E ratio to allow for the fact that high growth companies have high P-E's and low growth companies have low P-E's. And here's what they did. They took the P-E ratio and they divided by the expected growth rate in earnings. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose you have a stock that trades at a P-E ratio of 50. That's a high P-E ratio, right? But let's say the stock has a growth rate of 30%. And let's say you're comparing it to a stock that trades at a P-E ratio of 20. If I compare the 50 and the 20, it looks like the P-E ratio of 20 wins out every single time. But let's say the second company trades has a growth rate of 10%. So help me out here. First company has a P-E of 50 and a growth rate of 30%. 50 divided by 30 gives me a peg ratio of 1.6, right? 1.67, I guess we know. The second company has a PE ratio of 20. It has a growth rate of 10%. 20 by 10 gives me a peg ratio of 2. You pick the stock with a lower peg ratio. It's almost like you're saying, I want the best PE I can 
given the growth rate I have for this company. So many tech analysts, if you look at equity research reports for tech, will use the peg ratio. It's an extraordinarily dangerous ratio. Let me explain why. Remember how for a PE ratio I went back to a two-stage dividend discount model and extracted the variables that drive that PE ratio? When people use the peg ratio, one of the arguments they make is, if I divide by growth, I've made growth go away. I've neutralized growth. You can compare peg ratios across stocks with very different growth rates and be able to use it. Let's see if that's true. I took the, P, the, the equation for a two-stage dividend discount model, divided both sides, first by the earnings and then by the growth rate. So what I ended up with was an intrinsic value equation for the PEG ratio. I know it's, so it looks incredibly complicated, and there's a story in that incredibly complicated equation. If you look at the right-hand side of the equation, I'm giving you the variables that drive the PEG ratio. There's a payout ratio. There's a cost of equity. What's the third variable you see in there? You see growth. Growth doesn't, so the argument that if I divide by growth, it goes away is not true. Even after I divide for growth, growth stays in the equation. So when you tell me a stock with a higher peg ratio is more expensive than one with a lower peg ratio, and you said, don't worry about growth, I've already controlled for it, I'm going to say that's not true because peg ratios are affected by growth. Peg ratios are incredibly complicated to work with, and I'll use my hypothetical company to illustrate why. So if you look at the easy variables of peg ratios, holding all else constant, when you look at risk and payout, they affect peg ratio the same way they affect P ratio. Higher risk stocks will trade at lower peg ratios. Stocks that have higher payout ratios or higher returns on equity will trade at higher peg ratios. It's a growth variable where strange things start to happen as you change the growth rate of a company. So let me go back to that hypothetical example I used for my PE ratio. <clears throat> You remember the company that has 25% growth for the next five years, payout ratio? It's the same company used for the PE ratio, but now I'm going to use the PEG ratio equation to decide what PEG ratio I'd pay for the company. So I take the equation, I plug in the 20% payout ratio, 25% growth, and the 11.5% cost of equity in the high growth phase. 8% growth rate, 50% payout ratio, 11.5% cost of equity in the stable growth phase. I come up with a PEG ratio for this company, of 1.15. See, so what does that mean? If this stock were fairly priced, its peg ratio should be 1.15. So I've got a kind of a, the, the starting point. Guess what I'm going to do next? I'm going to change one variable at a time to see how my peg ratio changes as I change that variable. Let's start with the easy one first. As I increase the risk of the stock, holding the growth rate fixed, my peg ratio decreases. So riskier stocks will have lower peg ratios. I change the, the, re, the return equity, the payout ratio. There again, predictable things happen. As my return equity goes up, my peg ratio goes up. So keep in mind as I'm going through, high risk companies have low peg ratios, low return on equity companies have low peg ratios. You know why you need to keep tabs on it, right? Because in a minute, I'm going to ask you what a perfect stock is going to look like on a peg ratio basis, and you already have the things you need to ask. And now comes the messy part. I change the growth rate for the company. And initially, as I increase the growth rate, the peg ratio decreased. But at some point, it started going back up again. And this is a problem for a very simple reason. With PE ratios, what happens is growth increases. Price earnings ratios always increase. But with peg ratios, if I ask you what will happen as growth increases, you're going to say, well, it could increase, it could decrease, it could stay the same, depending on where you are on that graph. So let's summarize here. You've got risk, you've got return and equity and growth, just like with PE ratios. Risk and return equity affect PEG ratios exactly the same way as they affect PE ratios. Higher risk lowers PEG ratios, higher return equity increases PEG ratios. But growth, the effect can cut in both directions depending on which direction you're coming from. So here are three very simple propositions about peg ratios. And if you do get a sense, I'll send you a couple of links to equity research reports that use peg ratios so you can see them. First, are the things remaining equal? High-risk companies will have lower peg ratios than low-risk companies. Second, are the things remaining equal? The higher return on equity companies will have higher peg ratios than lower return on equity companies. And then I got to the third proposition. I wasn't quite sure how to state it. See why, right? Because it cuts in both directions. Other things remaining equal, if I trust this graph, companies that have peg ratios that are close to the average peg ratio, the average for the growth rate for the, for the sector, 
will trade at low peg ratios. And companies that have extreme growth rates in either direction, really low or really high growth rates, will end up trading at high peg ratios. So I think you're ready to give me my perfect undervalued peg ratio stock. So first, I want a low peg ratio, right? So that was easy. Do I want low risk or high risk? I want low risk because a high risk would, so I want low peg ratios, low risk. Do I want low return equity or high return equity? I want a high return equity. So low peg ratios, low risk, high return equity. Do I want low growth or high growth? I want growth right down the middle. This is the problem with peg ratios. Is what does right down the middle? You'll have to then look at, in fact, the only way to do this is probably take an average growth rate and then look at the difference from that growth rate. You want growth rates right down the middle. I think peg ratios are extremely difficult multiples to work with because of that growth effect. That doesn't stop people from using it, sometimes misusing it, but you can see how working through the mechanics gives you the red flags you need to have when you think about peg ratios. So any questions on peg ratios? Let's move on to price to book ratios. Price to book ratio, you take the market value of equity and you divide by the book value of equity. So you get a price to book ratio. Okay. And if you decide to do the algebra, here's how the algebra works out. If I take the dividend discount model and divide both sides of the dividend discount model by the book value of equity, there's my equation for the price to book ratio for a mature dividend paying company. It's a function of four variables, not three, but four. Price earnings was only three. So notice the fourth variable that's gonna pop up. Price to book ratios are a function of the growth rate, the risk, and the payout ratio, but now in addition, you have return on equity become a much more explicit variable. In fact, if you do a little algebra, you're gonna make it even simpler, but the price to book ratio for a company is a function of the return on equity, the payout ratio, the cost of equity, and the growth rate. I'm gonna do a little algebra, because remember when we talked about sustainable growth or fundamental growth, we said growth is equal to retention ratio times return equity, we wrote that as a growth rate. If I plug that in, I actually end up with a price to book ratio for a mature company as a function of two spreads. In the numerator, you have the spread between the return equity and the growth rate. In the denominator, you have the spread between the cost of equity and the growth rate. So if your company earns a return equity equal to its cost of equity, your price to book ratio will converge on one. If your company earns a return equity above its cost of equity, your price to book ratio will be higher than one. And if your return equity is lower than your cost of equity, your price to book ratio will be less than one. And the more growth you have, the more you jump this process and cause the differences to widen. So with price to book ratios, we know what we need to look for. So help me out here. If I want a really cheap stock, built on a price to book ratio, I want a low price to book ratio. I want low risk or high risk? I want low risk, I want high growth, I want high return equity. You find me that combination, we found a cheap stock. So again, we're building on the process, not so much, the equations themselves are not where I want you to end up. I want you to use the equations to get this list of these are the variables I want in a cheap company. Price to book ratio is an equity multiple. Numerator is market cap, denominator is book value of equity. There's a version of a book value multiple that instead of looking at equity values, looks at the entire company. And here's what I mean by that. In the numerator, you could have enterprise value. Enterprise value is market value of equity plus debt minus cash. So the market value of the operating assets. And in the denominator, instead of putting book equity, I put book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. So enterprise value to invested capital is basically like price to book, but for the entire company. The variables that drive enterprise value to invested capital, if you look at this equation, compare this equation to the price to book equation. Price to book is return equity minus growth divided by cost of equity minus growth. Enterprise value to invested capital is return on capital minus growth divided by cost to capital minus growth. Remember the big deal we made in discounted cash flow valuation about staying consistent? Same principles apply here. If you're talking about an enterprise value multiple, don't talk to me about return on equity, I don't care. I want to know what your return on capital is and what your cost of capital is because that's what's gonna drive whether you trade at above your book value or below your book value. But this is just the same technique that we bring into price to book applied to the entire company. When I first started looking at equity research reports in the 1980s, 
price earnings ratios ruled. I mean, 70% of equity research was built on price earnings ratios. Once in a while, you'll have this ratio called the EV to EBITDA multiple, maybe one in a hundred times. Today, you walk into almost any equity research report around the world, and you walk through and look at the different reports. About a third of all equity research is built on EV to EBITDA multiples, enterprise value in the numerator, market value of equity plus debt minus cash, and EBITDA in the denominator. Those of you who end up working in equity research or in banking, you're going to see this multiple all of the time. So I'm going to ask you a question that I ask whenever I run into an analyst who uses EV to EBITDA all the time. And let's see if you can, I actually promised three of you books. So if you can, you know, the three of you who, who remember that I forgot all about it. And you guys forgot, forgot about it too. You remember the question? So if, you're, if, if any of you are new books, you know, those three books, I'm going to add a fourth book to the mix. So here's my question, and this is a question I ask people who use EV to EBITDA all the time. Why do we net cash? If you look at the numerator, what do we do? We take market value of equity plus debt minus cash, right? And the denominator of EBITDA. Why do we net cash out of the numerator? We, we kind of answered the question. I gave the book away for the same answer. Let's see if we can get the same answer again. Yeah. Because you're not counting. Did you answer that question the first time too, or somebody else? So I just want to make sure people remember. So we subtract out interest income from the cash. So no, because interest income, which is what you get from cash, is not part of EBITDA. EV to EBITDA multiples. Right? Let's see what drives the EV to EBITDA multiple, and let's again do the algebra the same way we did with any of the equity multiples. Go back to a firm valuation model, and a firm valuation model now the value of a firm is the expected free cash flow to the firm one year out divided by cost of capital minus the growth rate. Let's do the algebra. If you look at the algebra, here's what the EV to EBITDA for a mature company should be. It's one minus the tax rate divided by co So basically, you look at the variables. Here are the variables that seem to drive EV to EBITDA. First, your tax rate seems to matter. The higher your tax rate, the lower your EV to EBITDA multiple. Why is that? Why do you think I care? Because when I did PE ratios, I never asked you what, the, what your tax rate was. When I do EV to EBITDA, I seem to worry about your tax rate. Why, when I did PE ratios, do I not care about the tax rate? When I do EV to EBITDA, I do. PE ratios, what's in my denominator? Net income, right? If I have a high tax rate, it's already been taken out. I'm hurt by it already. I don't have to ask you about it. It's already there. EBITDA, though, is a pre-tax number. So if you're, let's take an extreme scenario. Let's say you operate in a country where the government takes 100% of your profits. What multiple of EBITDA should I pay for you? Zero, because everybody, somebody's going to take away your profits. Why would I pay for you? So the higher your tax rate, the lower your EBITDA, EBITDA multiple. Second, if you take the next three variables, CapEx minus depreciation plus change in working capital. If I take capex plus de minus depreciation plus change in working capital, what is that? My, when I did DCF valuation, when I take those three items and I put them together, what do I come up with? Capex minus depreciation plus change in working capital. It's my reinvestment, right? It's how I get from EBIT times one minus T to free cash flow to the firm. Other things remaining equal, the more you have to reinvest as a company to get your given growth, right? the lower your EV to EBITDA is going to be. Why? Because we have to put in a lot of money to get the same growth rate. I'll pay a lower multiple of EBITDA. Other things remaining equal, the higher your cost of capital, the lower your EV to EBITDA. And other things remaining equal, the higher your growth rate, the higher your EV to EBITDA. So if you've got four variables. You've got the tax rate, your reinvestment rate, your, your cost of capital, and your growth rate. Already you can lay the foundations for what a cheap stock is going to look like to you if you're looking on an EV to EBITDA basis. Again, let me use a very simple example to illustrate how, as these variables change, my EV to EBITDA is going to change. Let's say you have a company which has a 36% tax rate. Let's also assume CapEx is 30% of EBITDA, depreciation is 20% of EBITDA. So my net CapEx is 10% of EBITDA, my cost of capital is 10%, let's ignore working capital. Why create a headache when you don't have to? Companies in stable growth expected to grow 5% a year forever. So I have my cost to capital, I have my growth rate, I have my depreciation, capex. Let's put the numbers in. And if I put the numbers into my equation, I end up with an EV to EBITDA for this company of 8.24. If this company traded, 
At 8.24 times EBITDA, it'll be trading at a fair price. So let's now change the variables one at a time and see what the impact is. First thing I did was I changed the tax rate. Holding all else constant, I said, what will happen to my tax rate? Instead of being 36, it goes to 40 or 50%. As my tax rate increases, my EBIT EBITDA comes down. You know how this is going to play out? Let's say you become the telecom analyst for Europe. So if you look at your sector, here's what you have. You have Irish Telecom, you have Deutsche Telecom, you have Spanish Telecom, you have Portuguese Telecom, you have French Telecom. Right? They're all in your sector. Those are countries with very different tax rates. In fact, if you're not careful, the Irish Telecom company is always going to look most expensive to you because it has the lowest tax rate. It's going to trade at the highest multiple of EB to EBITDA. So when tax rates vary across your sector, you should expect to see wide differences in EB to EBITDA. Second, holding all else constant for a given growth rate, the more companies have to reinvest that net capex is a person of EBITDA, the lower your EV to EBITDA will be. And finally, holding all else constant, if I look at the spread you earn above your cost of capital, return on capital minus cost of capital, the wider that spread, the more you earn above your cost of capital, the higher EV to EBITDA should be. So help me out here. I want to find a cheap stock based on EV to EBITDA. So I want a low EV to EBITDA, right? Do I want low tax rates or high tax rates? A high tax rate would explain away the low EV to EBITDA. So I want a low or no taxes. I want low reinvestment or high reinvestment. I want low reinvestment, a high return on capital, a high growth rate, a low. I mean, you can start listing off the items and you can start to develop the foundations of your screening based on EV to EBITDA. Your first screen will be find me stocks that traded less than eight times EBITDA. Your second screen will be find me stocks that have an effective tax rate less than 15%. Third screen will be find me companies that have growth rates greater than 10%. And the last screen might be find me companies that have cost of capital less than 8%. And by the time you're done, hopefully you'll have a few firms left over. Those are your cheap stocks. Again, you're looking for mismatches in picking stocks. So we've talked about peg ratios, price to book. I mean, if it looks like we're flying through, it's because we're using the same process over and over again. We're going back to DCF model, doing some algebra. So I'm going to close off my discussion of multiples by talking about revenue multiples. Again, I did exactly what I did with my other multiples. I went back to a discounted cash flow model, and I did the algebra. And I'll save you the trouble of the algebra. But here's what the revenue multiple, EV to sales for a company will look like? What are the variables that drive it? The EV to sales ratio for a company is a function of its cost to capital, its reinvestment rate, its growth rate, and its after-tax operating margin. But let's list the variables again. Cost to capital, growth rate, reinvestment rate, and what it earns as its margin. Higher margin companies should trade at higher multiples of revenues than lower margin companies. So you come to me with a company and you tell me that it's cheap based on trading at low multiples of revenues, I'm going to go down the list. What's your margin? What's your return capital? What's your cost of capital? What's your growth rate? By the time I'm done, I'm essentially going to rule out many of these companies that look cheap up front. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to use this as my basis for talking about the value of a brand name. Because I know in your marketing classes, you do throw around brand name values. It's a buzzword we throw all the time. But I want to narrow down the focus and say, if I wanted to value the brand name of a company, is there something I can use from this technology to be able to put a number on the company? And I'm going to argue that it's going to show up in one number. It's going to show up in the profit margin you have as a company. And if it shows up in the profit margin, it has to show up in the multiple of revenues I'm willing to pay for the company. So let's pick a company where brand name is the only reason that company has an advantage. I'm going to pick Coca-Cola. Why Coca-Cola? Because let's face it, there's nothing special about a Coca-Cola. It's water with sugar and crap put into a can, marked up and sold to you. There's nothing, you think, but Coca-Cola is different from Pepsi. That's what 100 years of advertising has done to your brain. I can't help that. Cola is cola. The only reason for one company having a high value, the other is pure brand name. So I'm going to show you something I actually did about 10 years ago. Actually, I was call, you know, somebody from Coca-Cola called me and said, can you come in and talk to us about the value of our company because we want to understand. So they got together the top management of Coca-Cola in Atlanta, flew out there, 
and I valued Coca-Cola for them using a traditional discounted cash flow model. So what you see here is my base case valuation of Coca-Cola. I took their cash flows, their growth rate. I did a basic DCF. I came up with a value of about 79.6 billion. I finished the valuation, and a guy in the front row, the marketing head honcho for Coca-Cola, puts up his hand. And he says, you forgot something very important. I said, what did I forget? Or maybe a whole business, operating income from something. I said, what did I forget? He said, you forgot that Coca-Cola is the most valuable brand name in the world. I said, what exactly do you want me to do? He said, you should be adding at least a 20% premium to your discounted cash flow valuation. I remember asking him, why 20%? He said, because that's what we do at Coca-Cola. When we buy brand name companies in other countries, we value them and then we add a 20% premium. My response was, just because you do stupid things doesn't mean I have to do stupid things too. He said, don't you think our brand name has value? I said, it has tons of value. He says, why aren't you adding a premium then? What's the answer to that? Because it's already in there. I don't know whether any of you, most of you are probably too young to have ever seen this ad for ragu spaghetti sauce, well, like 35 years ago. Go online, it's probably there somewhere. And here's how the ad begins. There's this 40-year-old Italian guy who wanders into his mom's house. Looks like he makes a practice of this big-time loser, obviously. He shows up at his mom's house, and his mom's in the kitchen preparing spaghetti sauce for him. And she's surrounded by these empty bottles of ragu spaghetti sauce. He comes and he's shocked. He says, Mom, you're making spaghetti sauce from a bottle you used to make it from scratch? To which her response should be, if you didn't show up every day, I'd make it from scratch. But since you show up every day, I'm... And then he starts listing off the ingredients in spaghetti sauce. I'm not very good at this, so if any of these ingredients don't belong, just take them out. So he says, it's sort of the obvious ones. Where are the tomatoes? She says, in there. Where's the oregano? It's in there. Where's the cayenne? I'm Indian, I throw cayenne at everything. It's in there. Okay. Every ingredient she, he lists off, he, she says, it's in there. That's what a good discounted cash flow valuation should be. When somebody says, where's the brand name? It's in there. Where's the quality of management? It's in there. Everything should be in there. There's no garnishing you can throw on top to make your valuation higher. So I gave him this example, and he wasn't impressed. He said, I don't believe you. And I got really lucky, and I was a little prepared for this. I knew this was coming. And I got lucky because I was able to find a company called Cott, C-O-T-T. It's a Canadian company that produces only generic stuff. It, produces, it sells as many cans of, generic, of soda as Coca-Cola does. You say, I've never heard of them? That's because they sell their soda to you know, supermarkets and they can put their own names on it. Like if you go into Pathmark or ShopRite, they have the generic sodas. Basically, Cot sells them the stuff. They're a generic manufacturer. They can put, you can put your name on it if you want. I looked at Cot, and here's what I saw. Look at Coca-Cola's operating margin, 15.57%. That's what you make as a margin if you put crap in a can Add sugar to it and then sell it for 80 cents. They get huge margins. Their biggest expense by far is advertising. It's not manufacturing. It's not the syrup. You can keep the syrup. Just sell me the brand name. I don't know. It's, the syrup doesn't even matter. Let's face it. You go to Mexico, you drink a Coke. It tastes nuts, nothing like the Coke in the U.S. So clearly, taste doesn't matter. Your syrup doesn't matter. The 15.57% margin is what Coca-Cola generates. The margins that Cot generates, and Cot does nothing, no advertising, but their margins are tiny because they sell their cans for like six cents a can, five cents a can, is, five, is about 5.28%. So here's what I did. I said, let's say tomorrow we wake up. I can't compare Coca-Cola to Cot. They're two different companies. So here's the question I asked. If tomorrow Coca-Cola woke up and its brand name was gone, don't ask me how that happens. It's a marketing person's nightmare. Let's make it come true. Your brand name is gone. What's going to happen? They're no longer going to get the front of grocery stores like they do now. They can't charge the prices that they do now. They'll become a generic soda manufacturer, and their margins are going to drop to 5.28%. And when your margins drop, there's a ripple effect. And here's what the ripple effect is. Lower margins beget lower returns on capital. So their return on capital, instead of being 21%, will drop to 7%. Lower returns on capital translate to lower growth rates. And if I trace it all the way through, if I value Coca-Cola with COTS margins, the value that I get is about 15.4 billion. The value that I got for Coca-Cola standing alone was 79.6 billion. 
the value that I get if, you, if I remove its brand name, if I give it generic margins, is 15.4 billion. The difference between those two is 64.2 billion. I just gave you a 64.2 billion dollar premium for brand name. Don't ask me to add 20% to that without giving me a good reason. A good discounted cash flow valuation already has brand name value embedded in it. If you want to break it out, you've got to do something like this. Now, I have to tell you, though, that was easy to do with Coca-Cola. It's much more difficult to do with Apple. Why is that? I'm sorry, what? No, you, let's say you find a generic smartphone manufacturer. I mean, there are some Chinese manufacturers, they sell at much lower costs. You know. Is the only difference, the reason for difference between, uh, let's take Apple and Samsung even. Is the only reason for the difference in margins the name on the phone? It's different operating system. In fact, with Apple, it's the operating system creates an entire, you could argue that the premium there, part of it is brand name, I think it is. Part of it is the operating system being unique. Part of it is, you could argue that what you capture as the value difference is a combination of three or four competitive advantages. Same rationale, if I ask you what the brand name value for Goldman Sachs is. Let's face it, among investment banks, Goldman Sachs is viewed as the premier investment bank, a brand name investment bank. The problem you're going to face is you can't hold all its costs, not just brand name that separates them from the competition. So this works best when you're valuing brand name at consumer product companies, at Kellogg's, at Coca-Cola. It tends to work less well if you're valuing brand name at electronics companies. I've asked you what's the brand name value for Google, because I don't think it fits as well. I don't think Google's strongest competitive advantage is brand name. It's something else. Walmart has no brand name value. You see, but it has lots of, it has competitive advantages. They come from economies of scale, cost advantages. Brand name is just one of many competitive advantages and isolating it is easy in some companies, more difficult in others. So what I'm gonna do rather than continue down the path of taking multiple after multiple is I'm gonna bring it all together in one page. And here's the way I think about the variables that drive multiples. If you go to the top of the page, I take a dividend discount model, right? That same dividend discount model allowed me to look at PE ratios and PEG ratios, and I took you through the process, but I've looked at PE, PEG, price to book. Essentially, I say, you give me any equity multiple, I'm gonna go back to the dividend discount model and tell you the variables that drive that multiple. So with PE, it's growth, payout, and risk. With PEG, it's growth, payout, and risk. With price to book, you throw in return equity. With price to sales, it's net profit margin. If you gave me an enterprise value multiple, I'm gonna go back to an enterprise value model. Free cash flow to the firm divided by cost of capital minus growth rate. And with every multiple, I'm gonna be able to say these are the three variables, or these are the four variables you should be controlling for. And with every multiple, I what I call a companion variable. What's a companion variable? It's a one number I need to know before I use that multiple. So I'm gonna ask you to guess what the companion variable is as I go down the mix. If I come to you with a low PE stock and I allowed you to ask me only one question, not the three I allowed you before, what's the one, one, what's the one question you're gonna ask me? What's the one number you'd like to know when you have PE ratio as your multiple? Probably gonna be growth. Because I know growth, risk, and return equity matter. If you're allowed only one question with PE, it's going to be growth. With PEG, I don't know, it might be risk. With price to book, it's gonna be return equity. With price to sales, it's net profit margin. With EV to EBIT, so basically you can go down the list. Every multiple, there's one companion variable. Now I'll give you a very simple trick that works for me to find the companion variable. If it's an equity multiple, here's what I'd like you to do. Divide net income by the denominator of your multiple. What the hell are you talking about? We'll see a couple of examples. So if it's an equity multiple, divide net income by the denominator of your multiple, you'll get the companion variable for that multiple. So let's try. Price to book equity. Right? So what did I say the companion variable was? Divide net income by the denominator. Net income divided by book equity is return equity. Price to book, the companion variable is return equity. Price to sales, divide net income by sales, you get net margin. You think it's not gonna work with price earnings. Net income divided by net income is one. Net income in the future divided by net income today is expected growth rate. So with an equity multiple, divide net income by the denominator of your multiple, you got your companion variable. 
with an enterprise value multiple. Divide after tax operating income by the denominator of your multiple, and you get the companion variable. So let's try EV to sales ratio. What's the companion variable? Divide after tax operating income by sales. After tax operating income divided by sales is after tax operating margin. EV to invested capital. Help me out here. I take after tax operating income divided by invested capital, I get return on capital. So any equity multiple divide net income by the denominator, any enterprise value multiple divide after tax operating income, you got your companion variable. So you're in a hurry, you have only 30 seconds to think up a question, that's the way to think about the question you should be asking when I try to sell you something based on a multiple. So every multiple has all of the inputs that drive value that you had in a DCF model, they're just implicit rather than explicit. So let's bring it to fruition. So we've defined, we've described, we've analyzed. So in the definitional part, you made sure you were consistent, you made sure you're estimating things the same way. In the descriptional part, you played money ball. You just looked at the statistics. In the analytical part, you went back to a discounted cash flow model to derive the variables. I'm going to bring it all to the final step, which is you want to apply this. And when you think about applying a multiple, there are two basic questions you've got to confront. The first is, when I decide to compare this company to other companies, what should I include as comparable firms? You see, the answer is easy. If I have a software company, I should be comparing to other software companies. If I have a telecom company, I have to compare to telecom companies. And I'm going to push back and say, why? There's nothing in valuation that requires you to be sector focused. A company in valuation that's similar to yours is a company with similar cash flow, similar growth, and similar risk. So if I'm valuing in Microsoft, maybe there's no software company out there that's remotely similar to Microsoft. So one of the things we're going to talk about is how to expand our sample when we don't have enough companies in the sector. The second is even if you're very careful about choosing those comparable companies, you'll always have differences between your company and those, and you have to think of ways of controlling for those differences. So here's the first thing that you're going to face, not just on the mystery project, but on the rest of your big project. Because after the DCF, one of the things I'm going to push you to do is to price your company. And to price your company, here's what you do. You have to take your company and compare it to other companies that you tell me are like your company. And here's the first fundamental choice you have to make. You can go with a small group of companies that are more like your company. So you might decide to pick companies that are just as big as you, in the same market as you, do the same thing as you, but you're going to end up with a small sample. The other is to say, look, I'm going to be much more careless about picking companies. I have a telecom company. I'm going to pick all telecom companies. You get a bigger sample of companies, but they're going to be more different from your company. You're saying, which is better? a small sample of companies just like mine, or a much bigger sample of companies which are different from mine. I've kind of given away my bias. You can probably guess where I'm going to go. But if you had to pick, which one would you pick? A small sample of companies very much like yours. And with capital like you, you can do all kinds of criteria and end up with five companies very much like yours. Or would you rather have 100 companies with differences across them? You take the second group, it's true those 100 companies are very different from yours, right? So if you just look at them as an average, you're right, the second group is dangerous. But if you can control for differences, and we talked about some of the ways you can control for differences, I would take the larger sample over the smaller sample every single time. So one of the techniques we have to talk about is how to control for differences across big groups of companies. We can't just eyeball the data. Because I think it's very dangerous to base your pricing on one other company. I remember when uh, Carl Icahn inv invested in Lyft. He invested when the pricing for Lyft was about $3 billion. And somebody asked him, well, why are you investing in Lyft? And he said, it looks cheap. And somebody asked him, cheap? Well, how? He said, relative to Uber, Lyft is cheap. That's a sample size of one. And in fact, a lot of pricing that happens in the VC business, it's small samples, sample size of one that you're extrapolating across different companies. So let's talk about how we make these comparisons. If you have two companies, that's all your sample is, Uber and Lyft, you can do direct comparisons, one item after another. The second is you can tell, try some storytelling. Basically, you say, well, this company is bigger, this has more growth, this is less risk. The third is to try to adjust your multiple for differences. That's what we try to do with peg ratios. We try to bring the growth in. And the fourth is to use some kind of a statistical technique to control for differences. 
I'm going to push towards statistical techniques because I don't trust my instincts when I tell stories and I try to price companies. So we're going to go through a series of examples. And here again, I'm going to play the role of an equity research analyst. And with every single example, act like an investor that I'm pitching to. And your job is to find out what I'm missing. So here's my first try. I'm the beverage analyst. And this is my sector. Okay, so list of companies at the P ratio growth and risk of the companies. So you ready? I'm going to put out a buy, uh, an equity research report. And the stocks I'm going to recommend you buy are Andre Wine and Hanson Natural. Let me go back to the previous page. See why I picked Andre Wine and Hanson Natural? Andre Wine has a P-E ratio of 8 point. So I basically picked the two stocks with the lowest P-E ratios. You know what Hanson Natural does, right? They produce these Hanson Natural sodas that you might have seen. Andre Wine produces champagne that's so cheap that you get a headache just watching the commercials. The only time you see that commercial is just before Christmas. But I'm picking those two companies because they have really low P-E ratios. So push back. They might be cheap, but with Andre Wine, what's the culprit? Why do you think they, they look cheap? I mean, in fact, those two stocks, if you look at them, you look at the second column, I give you the growth rate, they happen to be low growth companies. So they have low P-E ratios, they have low growth. Okay? I'm sorry, and Andre Wine and Tara. But Hansen actually looks interesting. It has low P-E and a high growth rate, right? So it looks like we're starting to see a mismatch, low P-E, high growth. But what's the next question you need to ask? How risky is it? In the last column, I give you the risk. And if you look at the risk, you'll see that even though Hansen looks cheap on a price earnings and growth basis, it's also the riskiest stock in the sector. So in this case, it looks like Hansen Natural and Andre Wine look cheap because they traded low P's. But when you dig a little deeper, with Andre Wine, the culprit is low growth. With Hansen, the culprit is high risk. So the next time you pick up an equity research report, you see a buy recommendation on top. It'll usually be based on something like this, a multiple and comparables. Don't let the equity research analyst set the agenda here and say, therefore, it's cheap. Your job, in a sense, is to push back saying, what might you be missing? And if the analyst is a good analyst, he or she should have thought through all of those questions and say, hey, that's not the reason, that's not the reason, that's not the reason. Because otherwise, all you're going to be doing is picking stocks based on low PEs or low price to book ratios or low EV to EBITDA multiples. Let's move on. I got fired as a beverage analyst after I put the Andre Wine and Hanson Natural recommendations. I've landed on my feet. I'm now looking at the telecom sector. It's the late 90s. The late 90s, around the world, a lot of government-owned telecom companies were being privatized in Latin America and Europe and Asia. And they were all getting listed in the US as ADRs. ADRs are foreign companies that are listed and traded in the US. And one of the nice things that comes out of ADRs is all their earnings have to get restated in US accounting rules. So basically, the earnings should be more comparable. So again, I'm going to play the role of an analyst. And the stocks I'm going to push on you are Telebras and Indosat. You know why? Because they traded really low PE ratios. Technically, that looks interesting. But with those two stocks, already I've given you a red flag as to why they might be trading at a low P ratio, right? What do you see for both companies? They have among the lowest growth rates. These are all in percentage terms. These are expected growth rates. So the two lowest PE stocks also happen to have the lowest growth rates. Here's the other thing you have to worry about. These are all telecom companies in different countries. Some are developed market telecom companies, some are emerging market telecom companies. For instance, you look at Deutsche Telekom or you look at Swisscom, they're parts of mature markets, but Indosat and, and Telebras are clearly in emerging markets. You're saying, so what? There's more risk. So if you look at this as a story, you're seeing low PE ratios, but you're also getting low growth and high risk. I could tell you stories from now till the cows come home. There's nothing you're going to be able to do with those stories. So here again, I decided to go the statistical route. So basically, I want to control for growth and I want to control for risk. But risk here is, are you a developed market telecom company or an emerging market telecom company? So I created what's called a dummy variable. You know what a dummy variable is? It takes on a value of either zero or one. So if you have a developed market telecom company, I put in a zero. And if you're an emerging market telecom company, I put in a one. I ran a regression of price earnings ratios against growth rates and that emerging market dummy. 
So let's see what we get. The price earnings ratio for every 1% increase in the growth rate increases by 1.21. So higher growth companies have higher P ratios. No surprise there. But here's the interesting variable. Look at the emerging market dummy. An emerging market company with the same growth rate as a developed market company has a P-E ratio 13.85 lower than the developed market telecom company. High risk companies traded lower P-E ratios. High growth companies traded higher P-E ratios. Now what is the stock I recommended? Telebras, right? If I plug in the numbers for Telebras into that regression, so the regression here is right here. If I plug in the, the, the growth rate for Telebras and the fact it's an emerging market company, the predicted P that I get for Telebras is 8.35. At 8.9 times earnings, Telebras actually looks overvalued, not undervalued, after you've controlled for differences in growth and risk. That multiple regression chapter that you slept through in your statistics class, you might want to go back and review because it's an incredibly powerful technique for controlling differences. On your mystery project, how many companies do you have? 200 companies. Don't try to eyeball them. You will just get dizzy. When you have 200 companies, storytelling will just get you into a corner. You have to find ways of controlling for differences. When you have that many companies, the only way to control for differences is the statistical drive. You guys have access to Minitab? Is that what you have downstairs? Okay. Or you have no idea? There is actually a statistics bag. The reason I'm saying that is Excel is a horrible way to run regressions because it requires the columns to be next to each other. You, it does strange things. It's not a flexible way of running regressions. So you need to use some, I use SPSS, which um, you can get at the bookstore, but you know, if you don't want to spend the money, Minitab is probably available downstairs. But you need to start thinking about multiple regressions again in a way differently from your statistics class. Now you're doing it to find cheap and expensive stocks. And the reason you bring in regressions is to control for differences across companies. Let me ask you a question, because this is something you're going to run into over time. See that R squared up there? 66%. Is that a good R squared or a bad R squared? First, you know, the higher the R squared, the better. The most it can be is, of course, 100%. I'll rule out 100%. You know, you know, none of you regret. You're going to be lucky to get 25, 30% R squared. So you're saying, is that good enough? To me, it's not a question of whether your R squared is good enough. When you have a low R squared, what, how does it affect you when you use the regression? Use the regression, you get a predicted value for Telebras, right? That te predicted value comes with a range around it. If you have a 100% R squared, the range is zero. So basically, you get a perfect value. The lower the R squared, the bigger the range is. So you don't have to worry about what's a high R squared, what's a low R squared. Your prediction range will take care of it. Because when you have to pick cheap or expensive stocks and your R squared is low, you might not be able to find too many cheap or expensive stocks because the range is going to get that big. The numbers I would watch for are these T statistics or F ratio, you know, F for T. So, you know, you'll usually get them as output from the regression. Remember, when you run a regression, you want the relationships you find to be statistically significant. And the number that will tell you whether it's statistically significant is not the R squared but the t-statistic. Do you remember what the t-statistic has to be for statistical significance to kick in? 0.5, too low, one not. Really, it's like a normal distribution. When you get to two, so when you say the t-statistic is two, you're saying this number is different from zero by at least two standard deviations. So you're looking for t-statistics of two, two and a half, three. The higher the number, the more part. In my case, the T statistics, uh, statistics I got were 3.78, 6.29, and 3.84. They're all statistically significant relationships. But you want to check the R squared and you want to check the T statistics to make sure. You think this is, I know this was a statistics class. Well, when you're dealing with lots of numbers and they're pulling you in different directions, this is exactly what statistics was designed for. Let's do one final example, and then we'll kind of wrap up. Okay. So I got fired as my, the telecom analyst after that Telebras recommendation, because that didn't work hard. Now I've landed as the banking analyst. And this is my sector. It's European banks. So I'm going to list them out. In the second column, you see the price to book ratios to the banks. In the third column, you see my return equity. And in the last column, 
I've put in a measure of the risk of the bank by looking at the standard deviation in stock prices. So price to book, return, equity, standard deviation. Help me out, you want a stock with a low price to book, but for a cheap stock, you want a high return equity or low return equity? You want a high return equity and you want a low standard deviation. Here's a very simple way to find cheap stocks if you don't want to use the statistics handbook. How do I know it's a low price to book ratio? What's a good way to kind of decide what's low or high in your sample? Rather than make up a number, what should you look at? The median gives you the 50th percentile, right? And in this case, the median price to book ratio is 2.07. So you look for stocks with a price to book ratio less than the median. You want a return on equity that's higher than the median, and you want a standard deviation that's lower than the median. So 2.07 is the median price to book. Return equity median is 11.82%, and the median standard deviation is about 21.93%. So I look for stocks with a price to book less than 2.07, a return equity of greater than 11.82%, and a standard deviation less than 213 So let's see where we are. 2.07 means it's just up to society. So basically, society general is the, is the lowest. I'm looking for 11.82%. OK, BNP Paribas looks like it's higher than 11.82%. And I'm looking for a standard deviation less than 21.93%. Unfortunately, Paribas, even though it has a lower price to book and a higher return equity, has a standard deviation that's higher. I have some really bad news. In this sector, nothing passes my cheapness test. You see what I mean by nothing? Nothing, but you have to keep looking. Sometimes if the sector is big enough, you might find something. And my overvalued stocks here are the stocks that go in the other direction, that traded a price to book greater than 2.07, there are quite a few, that have returns in equity less than 11 point, what is it, 11.82%? Okay, there's uh, Erste Bank, 10.28%, and have standard deviations higher than my average, just 21.82%. I think Erste Bank has a price to book higher than the median, a return equity lower than the median, and is a risk higher than the median. So if you don't want to use statistics, that's a very simplistic way in which you can look for cheap stocks, is to calculate the medians for each of your numbers and look for stocks that fall below the median on things like price to book and above the median on things like return and equity. Okay? But that worked because I had 25 banks. What if I have 250 banks or 500 banks? That's why when you run these regressions, you are in much more control because you're no longer just eyeballing the data. So I took banks and I regressed them against return equity and standard deviation. Remind me again what I'm checking for. I'm checking to see first whether the regression is statistically significant. I captured that in my R squared, but I also captured that by looking at my T statistics. My T statistics are all significantly above two. This is a statistically significant relationship and a regression that will give you predicted values that are pretty close to the actual numbers. This is the regression I used to get predicted price to book ratios for every bank. I plugged in each bank's return equity. And each bank's standard deviation of the regression, I get a predicted price to book. And here's what it looks like. Okay, so let's say Commerce Bank. Commerce Bank has a price to book ratio of 1.09. But given its return equity and standard deviation, its price to book ratio should be 1.05. The stock is actually slightly overvalued. And I do that for each and every bank. So what I get in my last column Am I cheap? And so if I were an automated equity research analyst, the stocks which have big negative numbers in front of them will be my undervalued stocks. I'll be putting buy recommendations on Royal Bank of Scotland, on Bayerishi, whatever. And I'll be putting sell on all the stocks which have big, where the price to book is much higher than the actual. In this case, that'll be Erste Bank and HSBC and Lloyd's would all get sell recommendations. Have I tested the strategy in the sense do they move back to the average? What did I say about how I? Does it um, give you any abnormal return? I'm not a pricer, right? I'm, I, so I do valuations. If I were a pricer, I would go out. I don't invest based on pricing. But if you want to play the pricing game, this is effectively what you're doing, right? So it, if you were a trader and you wanted to buy based on high PE or low PE, that's what it's worth testing. It does work over time. But it works over short periods, and if, you're a, if you believe in the pricing game. I'm not a believer in the pricing game, so I don't play this game. But if you track sectors over time, you do see multiples move back towards what you'd expect. I'll show, I'll show, show this with, with Whole Foods in the grocery food sector over six years. Because the only way to track this is to do the same sector 
in 2004, 2005. And if you're right, what should happen? The number should move towards your regression averages, and then they'll move out again. So you're going to see this ebb and flow. You'll see a stock become fairly valued, then become overvalued again. Fairly valued, overvalued again. And you can track the pricing game over time. It's not a game I feel comfortable playing because it's not my strength. But if you played the pricing game, this is as good a way to play it as any other. Yeah. Hundreds. I mean, basically, if you go in and type in the, you know what SSRN.com is? It's a social science research network where every working paper ever written anywhere in the world gets put there. Don't go, go there unless you want to get bored out of your wits. But basically, if you go into SSRN, it's a great site. You can type in PE ratios, and every working paper or published paper ever written on PE ratios would show up. So if you want to find anything to do with any multiple, go in there and see what people have found. Because especially with PE ratios and, and price to book ratios, there's enough research there that you can draw on. None of it is conclusive. Say, if you do this, you're guaranteed a profit. No, but nothing in investing is guaranteed anyway. But there are lots and lots of studies that look at how quickly it happens and why the convergence might be slower in some sectors than others. Yes? That's a good question. It's actually an excellent question. I didn't have to, right? Because I'm no longer in the DCF world. I don't use betas. I don't use standard deviations. With banks, what's a much, what's a much more sensible product? When you think about a risky bank, what, the, what, are, what is it that makes some banks risky and some banks safe? We kind of talked about this. Why does Deutsche look so risky right now? Because they have regulatory capital that is actually well below whatever the requirements are. You know what I could have used instead of the standard deviation? I could have used the tier one capital ratios, which you can pull from the S&P capital IQ. And lower tier one capital ratios will go with more risk, and higher tier one capital ratios will go with less risk. So when it comes to risk, it's up to you to define what you think is the right measure of risk for a sector. So for a bank, it might be regulatory capital. For an insurance company, it might be unclaimed premiums. You can pick your own proxy for risk. Now, in this case, I use standard deviation, partly because it was there already in that data set. But with a bank, there might be much better proxies for risk. Okay. Any other questions? So I'm going to close off today by looking at this price-to-book return and equity combination and what's been happening at U.S. banks, because there's a very interesting story underlying what's been happening at U.S. banks. So what this graph is, is actually a graph of price-to-book ratios collectively for U.S. banks and the return on equity at U.S. banks. So let's go back to the good old days, good old days being 2003, 2004, 2005. Banks traded at high price-to-book ratios, two and a half, three, five, six times book value. And if in 2006, if you ask me, well, can you explain the high price to book? My answer would have been, they earned really high returns in equity. So for much of that period, it's high price to book and high return equity. And then, of course, you get to 2008, and you have the crisis. First effect of that crisis is net income drops. You return in equity, which is the blue line. You see the drop off from 2007 to 2008 down to 2009. As the return equity drops, look at what's happening in the price to book ratio. It also drops. So, so far, up, up till 2009, we have a nice little story going. High return equity, high price to book, low return equity, low price to book. And then banks start to recover in terms of return equity. So you see the return equity start to climb back up. But notice what's happened to the price to book ratios. They're not bouncing back up with the returns in equity. So my question is actually an intuitive one. You can see why price to book ratios were high pre-2008 and returns in equity were high. You can see why the price to book ratio dropped in 2009 because returns in equity came down. So here's my question. Now that returns in equity are climbing back up, why aren't price to book ratios? Money center banks collectively in the US now trade at less than book value, even though they're reporting pretty healthy returns in equity. Why do you think price to book ratios have not bounced back up as returns in equity have gone up? I'm sorry? And in terms, of, in terms of the numbers, the metrics we use, where does that show up? What do we say drives the price to book? It's a difference between return and equity and cost of equity, right? 
So maybe pre-2008, people thought of banks as these nice, safe places to put your money at a low cost of equity. After the crisis, maybe they pushed up the cost of equity, and even though the return equity has climbed, the cost of equity has climbed with it. So that could be one. What else? What's the return equity based on? Net income last year, right? What's been the history of banks in the last 10 years? They keep telling you everything's good, everything's good, everything is good, and then one quarter they come out and say, oh my God, we forgot to tell you we lost $15 billion. <laughs> We've stopped trusting banks when they report income because they keep loading up and telling us these surprises, these bad surprises. The other thing that might be keeping price to book ratios down is people are saying, we don't trust you when you say you have a high return equity. Maybe you're just holding off and giving us bad news. There's also the third possibility, which is that banks today are cheap. That maybe that's where you should put your money. So when you look at entire sectors, it's actually interesting to see how sectors change and ask, is this a market mistake? Or is this the market adjusting to whatever the new reality is? So I know we've covered, we covered a lot of stuff. Take a look at what we did, the different examples, because it's going to lay the foundations for how you should approach the mystery project. My advice is get started on it sooner rather than later. Get the data into it. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Start working with the numbers to get comfortable with them.